So I want to show you through the two different files that we're working on, the model file and the visualization file. So the intention is we're working at a scale of one to one, where we're tra trying to create a real building in a way that is true to its real scale. And the overall intention, of course, is that we want to be able to build it and then visualize it. And so in order to visualize it, we don't want to overcomplicate it at the moment. So we're just talking about using the, the white model render, or in this case, it's actually just a 3D setting. So when we go to view, 3D view options, 3D styles, we're using the white model with shadows here in order for it to not look boring or ugly or inaccurate. If we were to change that to our detailed shading, we'd see that a lot of it would turn to the polka dot, partly because we're missing surfaces, uh, but the, the other surfaces just wouldn't be realistic with what we're trying to create. So in order to create the visualization, uh, in order to create it as an animation, because we also want to be able to do the fly arounds, fly throughs, walk throughs, in order to make that simple, changing the 3D style to something that is simple is going to make that easier. Great. The other model that we're working on is the same idea, but where we looked at, let's go back to this one just to make sense of it, where we're looking at something like a portal frame, in a lot of detail and accuracy, we're talking about a, a 10 or 12 mil flange and web, highly detailed. When we go to our model version, we need to simplify these a lot. These are going to be reproduced at a hundredth of the, the scale. And so where we have the thickness of a beam that might otherwise be 10 millimeters, if we take 10 millimeters and divide it by 100, we've got a tenth of a millimeter. And so that's too small. We can't create that as a model. So we need to dumb it down or beef it up in order for it to be able to be usable. We're, we're already a long way through this process. I'm just trying to explain this and talk about what's next. One of the things we have to think about is how to join elements. And so what we're talking about here is using tongues or using tabs to be able to intersect, connect to a roof structure. In this case, we're talking about the, the top of the portal frame, which is an, in effect the rafter. Uh, the reality is that there'd be purlins. The purlins join to the portal frame and then the roof sheeting sits on the purlins. But the purlins are too small to see at this scale. So instead of creating the purlins as objects, if we went back to here, we'll go. We'll just toggle between these because I think it's going to give us a, a very useful understanding. So if we look at the section, then we actually have purlins that are created as three-dimensional objects, modeled very accurately to scale. When we get to, again, a hundred times smaller than that, we're not going to see that. So instead, what we're doing is we're creating the roof just as one panel and into that panel we're going to scribe or etch the shape of the purlin but the overall panel will just be one piece. Now we need to cut holes into this shape. We're using fills at the moment and then we'll cut out this shape from here so we see that there's already that hole cut and with that hole cut out we can place this directly over. Now some of these are quite easy in terms of the understanding, but of course when we're talking about angles, the reality is in order to be able to create this shape, let's just take this away for a minute so I don't destroy it. If we then drag a copy, and it's probably good at the moment to group all that together, and we were to rotate it to the scale that we see here. We need to check that these teeth align in the angle, in the right angle as how they fit on the model. And so this is so much about not 
anything hard in ARCHICAD but trying to work it out in our head of what we're talking about. Now when we get two of these, we take the second one, do the same thing, and we'll group that together. Position it, rotate it, to check that it's aligned. At the end of the day, we have to realize that there's going to be a gap between these. So we're at the moment viewing these in plan, but in reality, when they're viewed in section, if I was to move that away three millimeters, let's just make sure that's grouped first. Uh, 300, move that away. we'd see that there's a wedge that's being created between it. And because we're cutting it out of a laser, well, we're cutting it with a laser, laser cutter, we can cut one surface, we can cut one orientation, but we can't cut in another, another way of saying that would be another axis. If we're using a, a more complicated machine uh, on a larger scale, like an, a CNC router, a CNC router allows us to cut in a lot of different axes. So we could cut this, so instead of having a, a horrible butt joint like that, that where it's not actually meeting, we could effectively mitre these joints so they would touch. So we'd be telling the machine not only how to cut it from above, but how to cut it from the side in order to make the side profile of that panel no longer straight. So we'd need to define that as well. So we're sort of keeping it relatively simple by only having to think about cutting in one orientation. But of course, what does that mean? We need to think about cutting a lot of different panels that are sitting in a lot of different orientations and simplify those. So when we're talking about a plan, a plan is simple enough, but then when we think about how we join that plan, how do these walls intersect, then we're trying to understand, well, what's a way that we can map these out so that these key together, or in this case we're talking about finger joints, in order for them to be able to fit into place, maybe without the need for glue or much glue, but also so that we don't have to wonder how they'll go together or where they go, but they can be identified by their unique shape. So this is what we're trying to achieve. In order to be able to make sure that this works, it's not enough just to do the 2D projection. So the 2D projection means that we set it up in a, in, a, in a position like this, and then we maybe extrude lines to make sure that these all line up where they're supposed to. So this is important, but it's not enough because there's just simply too much work to do to ensure that all of these are working in two dimensions without testing them again in three dimensions. So what do we do from here? We need to make sure that we're in our plan view, in a story when we're doing this because we're currently in a worksheet and we see that we don't have any of the uh, slabs, any of the three dimensional tools available while we're in our worksheet. So worksheets are great because they're separate from our 3D model, but in order to do the next process we need to go back into 3D. We'll keep this here and it's always good to keep a reference, we don't want to destroy that. Uh, and we could do it a few different ways, so we could just literally trace reference rather than copy paste. So we can go to our ground floor for instance. Now this is the other model and this has the other one in there. We have to decide, well do we want to remove all this information? Probably it's better to keep it at the moment. So rather than wrecking it, we might go to another story. Now there's some things we don't need to see like grids, so we could hide those layers. So if we just work on one story, on the roof story for now, and then we'll take the information that we were looking at before and so we'll go to the model walls, right click, show trace reference so we can see it. We need to know where it is and we need to make sure that our trace reference settings are allowing us to view all types. So we'll 
click all types, apply. We could make that uh, a bit bolder. We could make it blue if that's going to make it easier to read. And let's go back to Illustrator's reference. So now we can see all, the, all of those bits. What are we missing? Uh, we're missing the floor. Let's go back and see why we're missing it, because that was actually a trace reference as well. So where are we getting this information from? This information is coming from, if we're not sure, we see it's a ghost. We're seeing that this is coming from our model base. So we want both of these, so we can do it one at a time. Let's just do the walls first. Back up to ground, sorry, back up to roof. And now, in order to turn these into slabs, the fastest way to do this is to magic wand it. In terms of the slab setting, it's probably good to get this correct first. Uh, I'm going to add in a cover fill, and I'll make it yellow in this instance, 25%, so I can see through it. And the background has to be transparent, so I can see through it. What is it? I, I don't want it to be composite. I just want it to be a very simple shape. Um, I could use cavity. I could use a solid fill. Sometimes I use asphalt unless I've made my own solid shape. Uh, asphalt just because it gives us a solid fill. Uh, maybe a black outline. Maybe a red outline. It doesn't really matter. In terms of when we're printing this for cutting, red means cut and black means etch. So having the lines to represent the way that we want it, need it, is important. At the moment, not so much. We can change that later. And then if we want to recreate what we've done, the fastest way to do this is to magic wand over a shape. That will define it. Unfortunately, when we do that, it won't cut out any holes that are in the middle of the surface. It will obviously do all of the edges, but it won't cut out the holes. So to cut out the holes, we can do this in a couple of ways. We can select the slab, select an edge of the slab, choose our subtract from polygon option and then magic wand each of these do that process again it's already in subtract now so we just need to bring it back up again and that will work fine so that's one method uh, the other one let's find another one similar situation this one's got some holes in it as well magic wand uh, there's two ways we can do that we can magic wand inside a shape or we can magic wand on an edge Sometimes we'll find if a shape is like this and its edge is well defined and it's not hitting anything else, the edge is usually the better option. If the edge is not well defined and there's lots of other intersecting lines, inside would be the only method, but sometimes inside will not produce a full shape. Instead, we'll get a partial shape. So it will determine its own polygon and think the rest of it's too hard, so I'll stop there. One of the, one of the advantages to doing this is you might find errors. And this is a really good reason to use fills and not lines, because if you use lines, you might find that you have a few multiple lines all overlapping each other, or you might find that there's some lines that don't meet exactly. And if you try to magic wand a polygon and it doesn't work perfectly, you can almost be assured that there's a few lines that are not connecting properly. So by using fills or by using slabs, because it's a polygonal shape, you'll very quickly determine if there's any errors with your file. Another way to do that is to select the shape and look if there's any anomalies of additional nodes. If, for instance, there's an uh, additional node here or an additional node here, and it's just supposed to be a straight line, you know there's something wrong with the file. Either the fill itself had an additional node, maybe for some unknown reason, or if it was lines, that's because of where lines maybe aren't meeting or overlapping. So again, this is a very good troubleshooting method. Let's just finish this off. Uh, so another way that we can sometimes make this work is to select the slab, select the slab tool, and then if we magic wand, if we have to do multiples of these, you saw that time I didn't need to bring up the pet palette. I didn't need to bring up the subtract because I had selected the slab and selected the slab tool and I, and I was clicking over a shape. It identified, okay, he wants me to edit the shape. And so in this case, edit would mean subtract from. So that can be faster, particularly if you've got lots and lots of holes to cut. So we can go and finish those off. Now you sometimes have to give ArchiCAD a little bit of time to think about this and to reload uh, because depending on the complexity of the shape, this can slow 
the computer down considerably. So you can see already I'm working a little bit faster than it wants to. So it's having to think for a bit to make that work. I would suggest we put all of these onto one page. So once we've got all of the walls, then we might want to do the same with the floor. So we might want to turn on the model base, show us trace reference, and do the same thing. At the moment, I'm not worried about surfaces, but I'll get there in a minute. So we'll do the same thing. We'll click on the edge. Turn the trace reference off for a second just to see if that looks like it worked. If we see there's any of these shapes and they seem like they're closed on the outside, it probably means that there was an error with the placement of the fill underneath. So it's worth just picking up. So we see that some of these worked and some of these didn't work. So then we can go through and do a few things. So we can try to subtract again. So let's select the slab, select the slab tool, see if we can magic wand and then turn that off again. And that's exactly what I was talking about. You see how there's a red line on the outside? That red line tells me if I zoom in enough, and that's a very long way to zoom in, we see that that wasn't quite perfect. Now, fixing this can sometimes be a bit painful. We could stretch the end, and that would often work. Another way of doing this would be to offset edge, and I would prefer this method because this prevents me from accidentally changing the angle. If I was to stretch, I could accidentally change the angle without knowing. Instead, if I offset edge, I cannot make a mistake. I cannot stretch it by accident. Now, it's not worth me doing that one at a time, so it's better for me to select this, select the slab tool, go around and start subtracting all of them. I can see straight away there was an issue with that one. Undo if I know there's a problem. Let's try that again. Choosing a different place on the shape. And I can see there's that's quite large, in fact, so it's not quite on the end. Now, is it a big problem? Should I go back and fix the problem? I could. Let's just go and look at this one because that was the worst one I've seen so far. If we stretch that out and then I was to measure it, we'd see that that is 605. This one is 605 as well. So I could offset that five millimeters if I really felt like it was necessary in order to make that now the size that it should be. But we also need to remember that we're talking about something that's a hundredth of the size. So if we're saying it was five millimeters out, again, we're saying that's 0 0.05 millimeters. So when it comes to laser cutting, we're not even going to notice. This, however, is a problem. We don't want to leave this slither because every line we have on the page, and this is why it's important to use fills and slabs and not lines, every line, no matter whether it's visible, if that makes sense, if it's an independent line, if it's identifiable, the laser cutter will cut it. So that means you might have a place on your plan where the laser cutter is cutting 10 times because you've got 10 lines that overlap each other. So again, managing that is very, very important. Let's just try to finish this off quickly. So that's most of them done. We've got all of these internals uh, not yet finished, so I'm not going to um, take too long to do this. I'll just explain the next process. Once we've done that, it doesn't really matter what it looks like in plan. We can make, it's, it's fine, it's fine. I, like I know this, that's, I just don't want to bore you with doing the same thing over and over again. Um, what we want to do now is to, to make these more identifiable by using different colors, and we can use different colors in plan and we can use different colors in 3D, and we call those surfaces. And so we could say, okay, well, let's leave the bottom as yellow, and in this case, I'm going to not only make the, the fill, the cover fill yellow, but I'm also going to select all of these surfaces, and I'm gonna use IFC mechanical, because it's yellow, or I could use paint cadmium yellow. It doesn't really matter. Basically, I just want it to be yellow. Then I'm going to choose walls. Now I want to think about making sure that the walls that I use are never abutting the same color. I'm sure you drew those um, patterns as, as children, coloring in and making sure that you never had two shapes that were the same color next to each other. 
So in order, again, to be able to see this and make sense of it, we're going to select, we could do it one at a time. Uh, it's a little bit slower. Once we understand what we're doing, we could uh, use something like Control alt in order to be inject those settings. So we'll make this one bright orange or red. It's called cadmium orange, but it's quite red. And we'll make that one a uh, very dark orange. So it's identifiable. We can still see at least that's different enough from the yellow. Uh, we'll do the similar thing with this one. Again, we're using override settings because we don't actually care about the base material. We're just trying to create something that is um, colorful. And we'll make that one a deeper blue. Maybe more like that one. And we'll do one more and we'll make it green. Now I'm hoping that because I'm using three different colors, that means, or four different colors, that means I can be able to tell them all apart. I used, I clicked on the wrong thing then. I'll exchange the fill to green. And then I can go around the circle. So I can say, well, hopefully this orange red is never going to touch this one. And this blue one is never going to touch this one. Uh, this one here is a little bit more of a problem, but I can actually see that this one and this one are never going to touch. Similarly, this one and this one are never going to touch. Have I made a mistake here? And this one and this one are never going to touch. So now I've got multiple different colors. If I view these all in 3D, We can see this is nice and colorful. We can change those outlines to black now as well, possibly. So instead of having red edges, um, I'd like the edges now to be black. Let's just choose slabs here, slab control A to select all those slabs. Now I'm going to make them all black so that the edges are again identifiable, ident identifiably different from the surface itself. And these are all slabs, and that's really good, but they're not in the right orientation. So again, I will copy these, and in this case, let's do this by creating a new story above, and the advantage to that is that it's going to keep them in place. Copy, paste. The problem, of course, with doing any work in 3D where we're editing and wanting to use something like the marquee tool, we have to remember to use the thin marquee, not the thick marquee, so we don't edit multiple stories. But now we need to rotate these into the right orientation. So it might make the most sense if I do this in my 3D window rather than my 2D window. So I will select all of these, show selection marquee in 3D. Now, note, I'll do that one more time just slowly. I don't use the F5s or anything like that just because it can be confusing again for people that can't see what I'm doing on the screen but also uh, because it's very important in this instance that I want to show selection marquee in 3D F4 not show all in 3D command or control F4 so I don't want to do that so instead show selection only because I don't want to show every story I only want to show this top story now in order to rotate these, I need to turn them into morphs. Morph tool and shell tool are the only tools in ARCHICAD that allow us to rotate around any axis. This is a massive failing of ARCHICAD for a very long time. So thankfully when they created these tools, it's been able to make it a lot easier because otherwise we had to save it as an object and then add scripting in to be able to rotate it and that's crazy hard. So this makes a lot more sense. So in order to rotate this into the right orientation, we need to select it right click, convert selection to morph, and this is why we created a copy, because if I did this, it would have turned it from a slab into a morph and permanently. What have I forgotten to do? I haven't changed the thickness yet. So I know that in order for these to all work, they all need to be based on the idea that they're, what, 600 millimeters thick. So it's much easier to do that now before I turn them into a morph. Once I turn it into a morph, stretching it then becomes a little bit more fiddly. Now right click, 
convert selection to morph that's not going to automatically rotate it but it's going to make it easier now because these are very simple shapes uh, very geometric shapes they're square or rectangular this makes this process easier so if I grab an edge or grab a corner it doesn't matter it just gives me a different pet palette what do I want to do? I want to free rotate. So if I hover over there, that shows me what I want. Free rotate. And then when I have my free rotate, we see that it's giving me a protractor. When I move that protractor over different surfaces, some people could use, we could use the editing plane. I find the editing plane quite annoying. Um, I find it easier just to make an object or use an object. In this case, I can just use my own objects because we had them and they're rectangular, that works well. I, I need to choose the orientation that's going to rotate into the right way. So in this case, it's the end, because I want to rotate it up. Basically, what are we doing? We're doing tilt-up slab construction. Click, hold shift, click. Now, I'm not overly concerned with what I use as a reference point. I don't care if it's not perfectly right. Hopefully, I can make that work. And then if I'm not quite sure where I want to move it to, that's the point of these. So now I can select, I'll, I'll do this a little bit more uh, specifically, drag, choose that point. Which point do I want it to be? Let's choose this one. And I want to align that point with that point there. Now if that works, there's something satisfying about it. <laughs> we will see very quickly if there's errors uh, because we will start to see the idea of surfaces overlapping. We will see blue and yellow clashing together and we'll know that it, that's not working. Now, we can still be slightly deceived because we're using this view. So then the other thing that we should do is to change our view type and we could do this now or at the end and we can change from our detailed shading with shadows we don't really don't need shadows anymore we could just call that detailed shading but the other view that we'll toggle between is to go down to this one called wireframe and the advantage of wireframe is we see all of these lines so if I see double lines here sort of like I can see over here I know there's a problem but if I can see lines like this and that looks beautiful and clean, I know those intersections are lining up perfectly. So we're not using collision detection per se. Uh, there is an ability in ARCHICAD to do that with MEP modeling. And this is a very useful service when we're doing MEP, mechanical, um, electrical, plumbing, in order to be able to, and it's engineering, right? It's all of the different engineering requirements to be able to show services in a building. If we had thousands of pipes running through a building, it'd be very hard to determine if it was all working appropriately, particularly when we've got different professionals who are producing it. So they're each producing their own stuff. Of course, they all take their own things as of primary importance. And then when we put it all together, it's probably a big jumbled mess. And so we can use software like that MEP collision detection in order to be able to see that it works. We don't need to do that. Uh, we can just use some simpler methods here and we can see that it's working quite well. We, we can get onto some more complicated methods later if we feel that's necessary, but for now this should be fine. All right, let's go back, detailed shading, and then we just want to repeat that process. I'll do this one more time and then I'll get you to have a go at it. So we, we'll select this one, right click, convert selections to morph, same as before. This time, of course, we're rotating in the other orientation-ish. We're clicking on the edge, clicking to free rotate, making sure that we're in the right orientation. It doesn't matter which orientation we start from. As long as we rotate around 90 degrees, that's all that matters. I find it easiest to think about doing it this way, but whichever way it makes sense to you, again, is fine. Now, we've got multiple different points that we can use as reference. So now I can choose a different point this time just to show you that we don't just have to use that one reference point. So I'm going to choose this reference point here. Click, click, and again, that should be, ident hopefully, ideally, doing exactly what we want. There shouldn't be any issues. See, uh, I can see that there's a few millimeters and we already identified that before. There was a few millimeters where something was out. So we can 
if, if we can find it, then we should definitely go to the view options, wireframe, zoom in some more, see if we can see any issues there. It looks pretty good at this scale. There we go. It's just a couple of millimeters, just a couple of millimeters there, but not all that much. And again, when we're talking about a hundredth of this size, um, it's a couple of mils back there as well. It's not going to be a major issue. But as much as we can be perfect for as long as possible, that's really good. Uh, we don't want to keep working with errors because errors multiply. And when errors multiply, you can end up in a really bad place.